are often taught is that the United States of America is one of the greatest countries in human history. I doubt very many of you have ever questioned this claim, but you should. You should, you should all be asking yourselves why. In this modern, complex and fast-paced world that we share, it is vital to consider our ideas on what makes a country truly greater than others. As a state with an indisputable, prodigious past, I believe that America is stuck in an image of what it used to be and risks being left behind because of it. So what past are they dwelling on? I think that America's prime era of sorts was in the post-war boom of the 1940s to 1960s. The Eisenhower JFK era, where they did things not because it was easy, but because it was hard. Then again, from the 1980s to 1990s, where America was the shining city on a hill. And then the dot-com boom of the Clinton years that led to a prospering economy. Since 9-11, there really hasn't been the same sense of optimism again. America is behind in healthcare, education, and is high in violent gun crimes and obesity among both children and adults. Americans have seen their wages stagnate while the cost of living has rapidly gone up. Amer American manufacturing is just a shell of what it once was. And if even the vast majority of affordable products come from Asia. If you look at America's golden age of the 1950s to 1960s, you will see two things, a high tax on the rich and a reasonable military budget. That you just do not see anymore. Yes, America is certainly a powerful country, but what I want you all to consider here tonight is whether it is power that truly makes a country greater than others, or do we as a collective need to shed new perspective on what makes a country truly great. So when it comes down to the question, what makes a great country, it becomes important to highlight what we mean by great. We hear the words getting thrown around a lot in the media, and especially in politics. But what isn't commonly explored is what politicians <coughs> truly mean by greatness. I think that this is a particularly important question that we should all be asking ourselves at this point in time. There are a lot of things that divide us, but one thing that should unite us is that we all want to see our country prosper. We want it to stay great and to become even greater. I believe that to test a country's greatness or even to quantify it, we need a criteria. And within this criteria, it would be important to consider a world view. What do people want? When looking for what makes a country good, it isn't too hard for people to come up with things that they see necessary to quantify this. We often associate how much power a country holds or how deeply its influence is rooted and how employment rates have gone up or even its GDP with how good a country is. But when it comes to figuring out how well a country is serving its citizens, this criteria might not only be incomplete, it may not even be helpful at all. People nowadays are far more focused on whether a country is environmentally conscious, whether it's productively efficient, high in diversity, innovative, accepting and secure, although all of these may differ between political ideologies and cultures. At this point in my talk, I want to take a moment to introduce you all to the work of a Dutch social psychologist, Gert Hofstede. As a former IBM employee and a professor of organisational anthropology at the Maastricht University in the Netherlands, he is well known for his pioneering research on cross-cultural groups and organisations. Hofstede, assisted by others, came up with six basic issues that society needs to, as he put it, organise itself. These are called the dimensions of culture. In his work, Hofstede cited six dimensions of culture. Each of them has been expressed on a scale that runs roughly from zero to a hundred. The dimensions, however abstract they may sound, are individualism, uncertainty avoidance, power distance, long-term orientation, and masculinity versus femininity. I've put here on the slides a short description of what they each are for you to read, but I am only going to focus on one. 
The collectivism versus individualism dimension looks at the extent to which citizens within a country feel independent, as opposed to being independent as members of a collective whole. Individualism, in this case, does not mean egoism. It means that individual choice and decisions are expected from within a society. And collectivism does not mean closeness. It means that one knows one's place in life, which is determined socially. As you can see from this map, which Hofstede created for each of his six dimensions, it is rather easy to see a pattern. Much of the Western, perhaps more developed, if you like, nations, are much more about the individual, while the spread of collectivism spans far more into the Southern Americans, African and Asian continents. I don't really see an importance in highlighting this sort of cultural pattern. Yes, the West is far more about the individual, but this doesn't necessarily mean anything. There has been a long-standing debate about individualism over collectivism, but I don't see that one is better than the other. I simply see them as cultural differences and thus not a way of correctly ranking a country. The dimensions are a way of ranking countries far more on their cultural values and ideals than on economic factors. So it is still a step away from simply assuming that power equals greatness. But in terms of actually ranking countries, I am not convinced that these dimensions are straightforward enough or even accessible enough for everyone to understand. In an age now where progress is more social and less economic, GDP as an economic variable is certainly no longer sufficient to defining progress. In 2010, a group of global leaders from the social sector sought to develop a better understanding of a country's development and by extension, a better understanding of its development priorities. The name of their ranking was the Social Progress Index. The Social Progress Index, or SPI, is one of a number of indexes that collects data about countries worldwide. The index measures the extent to which countries provide for the social and environmental needs of their citizens. The SPI measures the well-being of a society by observing social and environmental outcomes directly rather than the economic factors. Their social and environmental factors include wellness, equality, inclusion, sustainability, personal freedom and safety in order to show a relative ranking of where countries are. In 2018, the top three countries on this ranking were Norway, Iceland and Switzerland, with the United Kingdom in 13th and the United States in 25th place respectively. It is important to establish how well a country serves its citizens, as it can help to establish a lot of things about the country, and that is exactly what this index does. Another way that has been developed of ranking countries is through the means of levels of happiness. The Happy Planet Index, or HPI, was developed by the New Economics Foundation. It takes a radically different approach on the, on the issues surrounding world rankings. It aims to measure well-being and happiness by taking a universal and long-term approach to understanding how efficiently people in a country are using environmental resources to live long and happy lives. This map created by the New Economic Foundation shows the results of the most recent Happy Planet Index. In a 2016 report from the perspective of people, the map shows the world resized according to the number of people living in each area, combined with the national HPI score. The report which was written alongside the ranking argued that GDP growth as a way of measuring a country's prosperity did not on its own mean a better life for everyone, particularly countries that were already wealthy. It caused countries to suffer bigger pay gaps between the rich and the poor, for example. For that reason, the indicators that are used for calculating HPI score range from life satisfaction, life expectancy, equality of outcome, and the size of a country's ecological footprint. On this index, Costa Rica came on top out of 140 countries, and it is because of its strong social networks, its deep connection to the environment, and its investment in health and education. Now there are, of course, many different possible ways of ranking a country. You may, of course, choose to rank countries on the quantity of mangoes produced, which would be India. Or you may even choose to rank a country on the size of its nuclear arsenal, 
which would of course be Russia. However, on a more serious note, and in my own opinion, giving the spiritual, physical, social and environmental health of people and the environment more prominence over mere economic development should be reflected more often in international efforts towards a sustainable future. Thank you.